minutes here. So just so a moment. We don't have to go back and, and we'll stop that. Um, now, I am thankful, even though we have been at this for six or seven weeks, that, um, and we probably will be for a few more weeks because again, um, we don't want to be ahead of everyone else when it comes to coming together. In fact, we cannot even come together more than in groups of 10 at this point. Uh, and it's going to be a gradual approach to, uh, towards normality within our church as well as within our society. So again, you know, considering that we have been doing this for so many weeks, uh, Dr. Bryant, are you there with me at this point? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, why don't you share with us some, from strictly medical point of view, uh, what can you share with us about this virus that is, if anything, different from from other things uh, that have, we have experienced from year to year? Um, yeah, as I've kind of sat back and tried to look at this from a big picture kind of view, global kind of view, um, we know that this virus came somewhere near the end of last year. And the thing about this virus is that, you know, this is a totally new coronavirus to the human population. And that's, that's part of the big issue with this is that it's totally new. Not, none of the humankind has any natural immunity to it. And so it's everyone's free game for this virus. And it's extremely contagious. We've seen that. It's almost like a, a, a nuclear reaction where one atom you know, explodes and causes multiple others to, to go too. So, you know, the contagiousness is something else. Um, and, you know, there's questions arising, is this really any different than seasonal flu? And as I look at it, I've asked myself, have we seen healthcare systems around the world like we have be overwhelmed with seasonal flu? And the answer is no, we don't have healthcare systems being every year overwhelmed like they have been this year. So this seems to be different than the seasonal flu as far as I'm concerned when I look at it. Um, the other, the other thing is that we can be thankful here in Wichita that we've not been hit like New York City or New Orleans and so forth. We can praise God and thank him that we have been spared that kind of brunt. On the other hand, and, we, and, and you know, we can be thankful that for the vast majority of people, they're not seriously affected by it. For me, I'm dealing with a population that unfortunately are seriously affected. I mean, 15% mortality rate or more in the, in the nursing home population. So for me, I know that if, if, if the virus gets into a nursing home, the game's pretty much over. All, it just spreads like wildfire through the home. It's really hard to contain. So I've, as I've thought about this, I've thought, you know, when, when God went to Cain after he had killed Abel, you know, and talking to him, Cain said, well, am I my brother's keeper? And I think this, that message comes home to us that while we may not be affected by it, we, we may infect others who could potentially be seriously affected by it. So I think we need to take take that seriously, that while it may not affect me, I still need to try and prevent spreading it to other people who could be seriously affected by it. So those are kind of my thoughts as I'm looking at this at this point in time. All right, thank you for sharing that. So basically, um, you know, there are a lot of people um, in our society, in our country that um, uh, are, um, kind of getting a little impatient with this. Um, and it, it's, it's probably good to, to take a, a close look at the medical uh, facts and, and also as a church, you know, from my perspective, you know, we are, we're not here as Republicans or Democrats or, or this or that. We are here as Christians wanting to reach people with the good news of the gospel. And as I've said before, um, 
we should be very concerned about not spreading anything but the good news. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and so I, we are taking precautions. We'll be careful. In the early church, um, people worshipped in homes. They worshipped in, in small groups. Um, a church is not a building. The church is people. And so we're not preventing people from going to church. We're being together right now. Um, and so I'm thankful that, um, that um, uh, you know, I'm thankful that we have a lot of medical personnel in our church that have a little different perspective on this than, than the average Joe in the church, because, you know, you are in the middle of it. And in fact, we have one person coming up next. Uh, Paula Curry will be sharing the children's story with us. And uh, before she does that, you know, she's in the medical field and, uh, and, um, she also probably has a perspective on this. But before she begins the children's story, let me lead you in a short prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I'm just thankful that we can come together, uh, even during this um, pandemic, and to um, worship, to study, to have fellowship. Um, and I pray that you will guide us as we, as we um, uh, make decisions forward for this church. <clears throat> And also for the leaders, I pray that they, you'll help them to make decisions that are wise when it comes to this pandemic. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Paula, go ahead and share a story with us or for the, with the children. That's, <laughs> oh. that's with us as well, right? Everybody will enjoy this story. What I do want to tell everyone is to write down yourstoryhour.org. And you can hear more of this story. It's called Never, Never, Never. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all your might. The story today is about a little girl named Ida. Ida was born to missionary parents in India. Her dad and her grandfather were um, doctors in India. But as a child, she saw how many people were poor and sick and didn't have enough food. She was able though, when she grew up to go to school in America and she studied at um, Moody's um, Northfield Seminary. But at school, she earned a reputation for pranks. So she was kind of ornery at school. Well, after her schooling was completed, the first schooling that she went to, she expected to get married and stay in the United States and not go back to India. Because she said, never, never, never will I be a medical missionary. I don't want to do that. But she was asked in 1890 after school to return to India to help her father with her mother because her mother was sick. Now, Ida had already said, I do not, never, never, never do I want to be a medical missionary. But during her stay while she was in India, something happened. One night, a man came to her home and asked her to come and help because she knew he knew her dad was a doctor. He knew she could help. He asked her to come to his home and help his wife have her baby. And she said, no, get my dad. Let me get my dad. And he said, no, no man can ever look at my wife, can ever see my wife, only me like that. So you have to come and help her. And she said, I'm sorry, I can't. And the man went away very sad. And another man came to his house and asked for the same thing. Please come. My wife is having her baby and I need you to help me. And she answered the same way. No, I can't. Let me get my dad. No, your dad can't come. You have to come. And again, he went away very sad. And a third man came and asked the same thing. And she said the same thing. I'm sorry. And that night, three women died because their babies, they couldn't have their babies and they got very sick and died. And she was so very sad, except she realized that her resolve to never, never, never become a medical missionary changed. She knew that God wanted her to become a doctor and return to India. And there's just a small problem with her becoming a doctor because back then women didn't go to medical school, but she went back to America. She came back to the United States and she went to school at Cornell in New York City. And she was part of the first class that allowed women to become a doctor. And while she was there, she was asked, her father had asked her to raise money to put a clinic, to build a clinic in India near Valore. And so she went to visit people and they would say, oh, I will give a hundred dollars or I will give $50 or $20 but she needed $8,000. 
And she had gone to see someone who she knew would probably help her very much. But she said, well, we could probably help you $200. And when she had gone in to talk to this woman, she had passed by a man sitting in his light in the library of that house. And she didn't pay any attention. The woman didn't say anything to him. So she talked, but he had been listening to their conversation. And the next day he called her and asked her to come and see him. And he asked her what she was doing and, and what they were wanting to do and build this clinic. And he said, hmm, well, here is a check for you. Will this do? And she opened, he asked her how much she needed. And she said, well, my father said it would take at least $8,000. And that was a long time ago, so it would be a lot more today. And he handed her a check, and when she opened the check, it was for $10,000. He said that his wife had died, and he had been very sad, but he was looking for something to share something to be that would do good because she was such a good woman, and he loved her so much. So he gave her $10,000 to build a clinic at Valor. <clears throat> so she returned to India as a doctor, and her father died soon after she left, or soon after she returned to India. So in the first two years after she built her clinic, she saw 5,000 people. She opened the Mary Tabor Shelf Hospital in 1902, and that was the name of the wife of the man who gave the money to her. Well, she worked for a while all by herself with nurses, and she realized she needed help. This was too big a job for one person, but... How hard was it for her to be a doctor and how hard was it for her to find help? Then she thought this would be crazy. So she decided that she would build a medical school for women. And so she did. She began a medical school in Valor for women. But a lot of people didn't encourage her very much. They said, you won't even get three women to come to be a doctor. So she built her school and she has her hospital and the clinic probably got moved into the hospital. But... In the first year, in 1918, she had 151 women apply to become doctors. And then people were saying they probably won't do very well. So she waited and they studied hard. They worked hard together. And of those who were chosen, I think it was either 67 or 77, all of them passed and became doctors over time. One of the things why I like this story is because she found something to do that was right at hand. And right now we're all at home. Well, some of us are all at home. I'm still working. But when we're at home, and even at home, when I'm home, I find the things to do that are right at hand. She found something to do that was a very, very important thing to do. So I encourage each of you, boys and girls and men and women, if there's something at hand we need to do, let's do it. Let's take care of it because the scriptures tell us to do what we find to do with our hands, to do it with all our might. And so you can look up Ida, Dr. Ida Scudder on, um, online, or you can listen to her story at your story hour. And I pray that we never, never, never say, I don't want to do what's right at hand for me to do. Let's listen for God's voice and do what he would have us to do. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Paula, for sharing uh, this story. It is a great story for uh, with us. Um, uh, Paula Curry, just to share the children's story with us. And for those of you who come in from, have just tuned in, in uh, on the radio, uh, 101.7 FM. Uh, we are um, right now in the Three Angels Seven Day Adventist Church uh, um, uh, worship service here. And uh, at this point, uh, Dixon Onsare, a young man in our church, will be sharing. Uh, um, what is uh, what the offering goes to this uh, particular Sabbath? So, Dixon, I'm going to share a screen with you so that you can uh, everyone can see what the offering is for. Go ahead, Dixon. Yes, our offering today will be going to the church budget, and um, there's a verse in Second Corinthians nine seven that that says, "Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give." not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I also wanted to share a quote with you from Councils on Stewardship, chapter 40. And it says that all, we, all that we do is to be done willingly. We are to bring our offerings with joy and gratitude. By giving will, willingly, we show that we, we recognize and acknowledge that everything belongs to God. 
If we have given our hearts to Jesus, we should also bring our gifts to him. The richest offering is too small compared to the gift of the only begotten son of the infinite God. Through self-denial, the poorest will find ways of obtaining something to give back to God. So we are able to contribute or give our offerings and our tithes to the, to the church via an application called Adventist Giving, or we can mail our tithes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's a wonderful counsel on stewardship that you just shared with us. And um, Dan uh, Tierney, uh, I realize that, you know, Dan Tierney will now have the morning prayer, but before he does that, um, again, let me just repeat the various ways whereby you can return uh, your offerings and tithes to the church. Uh, you know, you can go to the website, threeangels.org, and, uh, and uh, there is a giving uh, menu item there that you can, you can, it will take you to Adventist giving, and you can give there. Or you can uh, send a, a tight envelope or a check to the church treasurer, um, or you can send it to me or to the conference office, and we will make sure that it gets to the right place. Um, but yes, uh, we are so thankful for the giving patterns in this church and for your faithfulness. We're not giving to the church, we're giving to the Lord. And, um, and um, we just um, have um, creative ways whereby we can do that, even if we are stuck at home. All right, at this time, Dan, why don't you lead us in the morning prayer here at Three Angel Church? Mm -hmm. Shall we bow our heads? Father, we thank you so much for the Sabbath day. We thank you that we can be together even though we aren't in the same location. We thank you for the technology that you've allowed to be created that gives us this opportunity. We pray for um, those that are sick. We pray especially for those that might have the, uh, the coronavirus, that you'd be especially with them. And we pray for our health care workers, especially the ones in our church and all the health care workers, that, that you might keep them safe, that you might protect them, and to uh, give them wisdom as far as how to take care of the patients and how to uh, keep, the, keep sanitary and all that. We pray also for the leaders of the country and the leaders of the church and that you will give all uh, the wisdom is needed to know how to get back to normal. We pray for um, those that may not be able to join us today through the internet, that you'd be with them and, and give them uh, a Sabbath blessing. We thank you, Lord, and we come in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, Jean and Sarah Draggett will now be uh, uh, sharing a song with us. Very deep. 
deep in my innermost soul, so secure that no power can mine it away, while the years of eternity roll. I believe when I rise to that city of peace, where the author of peace I shall see, that will strain up the song which the ransomed will sing, in the heavenly kingdom will be. Amen. Thank you for sharing that beautiful song. Before I begin my message this morning, um, I just want to refer you to what's happening this afternoon. Uh, you know, again, we have a series of meetings going on. Hope Awakens uh, is a series, and you'll find it at uh, hopeawakens.com or hopeawakens.org. You can get to it either way. And if you go there in the afternoon today at uh, two o'clock, it's going to be on at two o'clock today there. Uh, there's another meeting at Hope Awakens at six o'clock. So today you have two meetings, uh, two o'clock and it's six o'clock. Um, there was one at 10 o'clock in the morning. Did I say two o'clock? I actually, I meant one o'clock. One o'clock and four and four o'clock. <laughs> uh, sorry, one o'clock is the meeting. I was a little confused here, but uh, on Saturday mornings from now on, there are two meetings. One in the central time zone is at 10 a.m. and at um, um, 1 p.m. But since we have our services in the morning, um, I would uh, recommend the afternoon meeting. We need our local flavor as well. So uh, again, uh, if you need to, if you'd like to be part of that, and you haven't yet haven't yet um, uh, attended any of these uh, meetings, um, I would encourage you to go to hopeawakens.com or org this afternoon, and um, they've been they've been a great blessing to many people. It's a world worldwide uh, reach kind of meeting, uh, tens of thousands of people um, that are tuning in. Now. <sighs> Let me share with you a few recent headlines. Uh, here's one of them. U.S. coronavirus cases doubling in a week. Here's another one. Uh, what if this lockdown is only the beginning? And uh, this uh, last week I came across this headline. Second wave could be worse, it says. It's talking about what could happen in the fall, etc. Uh, here's another one. Food distribution systems break down. Um, millions of Americans say coronavirus, a wake-up call from God. Now, 
It's interesting. I just took a little sample of headlines. There's been a lot of interesting headlines. One headline in a major American newspaper said, this is a uh, uh, pestilence of biblical proportions. You know, in the US, there have been more than a million cases so far, resulting in 65,000 deaths. And that to some people may not sound like an awful lot when you think of how many, how many people die from the flu in a year, but we're talking 65,000 deaths in a matter of weeks. And that's with an incredible amount of resources being put into stopping it. And so uh, it's very sobering when you consider the fact that in January, most of us had never heard of this virus called COVID-19. We have never seen anything like this in our generation. Early this year, we all had our plans for 2020. Whatever they were, we have already turned our back on them now because the virus has put the whole world in a virtual timeout. Uh, Gene and I were going to Norway for a family reunion in May. We have planned this since last year. In fact, we planned it years ago. Uh, but we had our tickets bought last year. Well, we're not going. Um, the general conference session for the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been postponed for a year. Now that's a first as well. Uh, so many plans have changed for everyone. Uh, there are people getting impatient and they're saying, this is not a big deal. But it is clearly a big deal. And... Um, Again, as I said, we haven't experienced anything like it in our generation. Uh, people left and right are turning to the Bible. I just read an article entitled, uh, What Does the Bible Teach About Pestilence, Plagues, and Global Pandemics? It's written by Joel Rosenberg, a New York Times bestselling author and uh, a very influential person in the evangelical world. He has also addressed members of Congress and he has met with government leaders around the world, including uh, US presidents. And in this article, he's addressing last day events. Now that used to be an Adventist topic. We were the ones who talked about this kind of stuff, but now it's all over the place. Mr. Rosenberg, who is not an Adventist, points to the fact that the Bible uses the words pestilence or plague at least 127 times, starting with the plagues in Egypt and ending with the plagues in Revelation. And then he says, in between Egypt and Revelation, you have other striking examples of God using pestilence as part of his divine purpose. And then he adds, in number 16, 14,000 people died because of a plague. In numbers 25, 24,000 people died because of a plague. In 2 Samuel 24, 70,000 died because of a pestilence from God. And so he says, well, there's biblical precedence for God um, allowing these kinds of things or utilizing these kinds of things or causing these kinds of things. And then he moves on to Matthew 24 and this chapter, which is about the signs of the end, and including uh, pestilences, he talks about that and he asks, how does this apply to the coronavirus? And he answers his own question this way. He says, well, God uses pestilences to get our attention. And even though this particular pandemic is not necessarily a sign of the end, or the end end, it serves as a wake up call to prepare us for worse things to come. Now, I may disagree with uh, Joel Rosenstein on a number of things that I'm not going to go into here, but he is absolutely right here in this particular statement that, um, you know what? We are living in a time of the end and this may be a sign of worse things to come. The Bible talks very clearly about worse things to come. As we spoke about on a recent Sabbath, Jesus used birth pains as a metaphor in Matthew 24. 
to illustrate that these kinds of events or scares like the one we're going through right now will become more and more frequent and more and more scary in the days ahead for a lot of people. Before Jesus comes back, the world will seem to disintegrate before our eyes. The very systems in which we have placed so much confidence will utterly fail and uh, chaos will spread across the world and eventually men and women will cry out for a spiritual leader to bring them peace and safety. The Bible talks about this and we know all of this from the scriptures and from the spirit of prophecy. Uh, in Luke chapter 21 and verse 26, Jesus said that in those days, men will be fainting, he says, from fear and expectation of the things which are coming upon the world. So that's what's in store for us. Now, I'm not preaching here uh, fear. I'm, I don't want to focus on what is fearful, but I want to lay the foundation. I want to um, have a frame in place so that we can know where we are. You know, in those frightful hours of Earth's history that is coming upon us, and again, this virus is nothing compared to what's coming. A man of peace will rise with promise of deliverance for those who follow him. And the whole world will follow what the Bible refers to as the Antichrist power. As Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we know what's coming. More and more, we see the contours of what lies ahead. This uh, coronavirus is just one of many uh, preambles, if you will, to the main event. The world will be afflicted with pestilence far worse than the coronavirus. Men and women from all nations will experience uh, pestilences that no doctor can cure. There will be death on a scale we've never seen before. And possibly there will be uh, pandemics of super viruses worse than the Black Plague. I really believe that is coming. And uh, there are many other things also as well, in addition to pandemics and pestilences that will take place. But even though there are many different kind of preambles to the main event uh, and coronavirus is being one of them, these kinds of things that we're going through right now um, help us see, it, helps the world to see uh, the uh, inherent vulnerabilities that we have. The invisible enemy has brought the world to its knees, both figuratively and literally. According to a poll taken during the last few weeks, 44% of Americans believe the coronavirus pandemic is a sign for America to wake up and turn back to God. Now, as Seventh-day Adventists, we have an idea what that will eventually lead to, don't we? Many more of these events, of these experiences, and the masses of people in this world will be ready to embrace a spiritual leader, a power, an antichrist power that the Bible talks about as a way out of the mess that this world finds itself in. So darker times are ahead. There is no doubt about it. But there are also good things happening. Many people are waking up, as the poll suggested, and many of them are on their knees, turned towards God. And that's why we have the Hope Awaken series going on, to tap into that need to give people hope from the scriptures, from the word of God. You know, Jesus made a remarkable promise to those who look to God. In this world, he said, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world, John 16, verse 13. Now, notice that he doesn't say, I have overcome your trouble, but he says, I have overcome the world. He's telling us, don't worry, I've got this. Don't worry about anything. Be praying about everything. Focus on what matters the most. Uh, you know, in Matthew 24, verse six, Jesus said, see that you are not alarmed. So Jesus told us how to respond in such dark times and darker times to come. Uh, Luke 21, verse 28. Now, when these things begin to happen, Jesus says, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. 
Now that's the opposite of what's natural, isn't it? Uh, look up instead of being scared, look up and you know, your redemption is near. That's faith, that Holy Spirit led life. They can look up during these circumstances. That's the kind of thing that will help others around us see Jesus in us. They will gain hope from watching us and they will find what they're looking for. You know, trials reveal the contents of every heart. As Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we ought to be the calmest people on earth because we know the Lord and he holds the future in his hands. Jesus even said about the last day events, he said, these things must happen. These kind of things and the worst things to come do not surprise God. He is seated on his throne. He's not pacing the floor, wondering what will happen next. When chaos breaks out on earth, perfect peace reigns in heaven. In a practical sense, what should this mean for us? Maybe rather than looking around us, it's time for us to take a good look in the mirror. What do we see? Are we serious about our faith? Do we have the presence of the Holy Spirit? Are we experiencing the peace of heaven in our hearts? Or are we anxious, living in fear as people without hope? Many people are on the run today. They find all kinds of escapes, but they can't hide from the second coming of Jesus. Luke 3 verse 7, uh, John the Baptist uh, said to the multitude that came forth to be baptized, the Bible says, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? There is going to be a day of the Lord. There is going to be, and the Bible tells us, a day of wrath. A day where God's wrath is poured out without mixture. And uh, at that time, there will be no escape. There will be no second chance. Those that have hope have hope. Those that are not ready, well, they're facing the end, the end of all things. It doesn't matter whether you are at the US space station or in a bunker under a mountain somewhere, nothing is gonna keep you safe in that day. Nothing you have will keep you safe. Amos 5 verses 18 and 19 talks about those who try to save themselves. Listen to this, it says, woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or as though he went into the house, leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. Now this is almost comedic, uh, it, it's almost funny, except it's so tragic. You know, you think you're safe and then whew, you're bitten. Just nowhere to hide. Where are you going to go? There is nowhere to run. But the Bible tells us that we need a place to hide. Isaiah 26 verse 20, come my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself as it were for a little moment until the indignation is past. We need to hide ourselves until the indignation is past, it says. And it's referring to the wrath of God when he talks about the indignation. It's referring to the plagues that are coming upon this world. And let me continue. It says, for behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will also disclose her blood. What does that mean? Well, that's referring to all the innocent blood that people are guilty of, that this world is guilty of. The earth is going to pay for it. There is going to be a reckoning from a loving and just God for all the evil that has been caused so many people, for all the victims of violence, for all the victims of oppression, 
for everything evil that's ever happened, there will be a reckoning. And then he says, and will no more cover her slain. So there is a day of judgment. But God says there is a place where we can hide. Many Seventh-day Adventist Christians feel conflicted about this. We want to trust the Lord, but we also want to, to know practically what we can do to prepare for these contingencies. How many of you remember when the plagues went over Egypt? Let me see your hand. I think some of you raised your hand. You remember that? That was 5,000 years ago. You must be very, very old indeed. <laughs> but how many plagues were there? There were 10, right? There were 10 in Egypt. And the last seven of them only fell on the Egyptians, not on the people of God. And in the same way, this, the seven last plagues in the book of Revelation do not fall on God's people. The last plague that hit Egypt was the death of the firstborn, wasn't it? And, and God said that there was only one way to be protected and delivered during the plagues. And do you remember what it was? It's called the Passover. The house was sanitized from this disease that went through the land of Egypt. Um, and how was it sanitized? By the blood of the lamb. It was sanitized from sin, from the guilt of sin by the blood of the lamb. Exodus 12 verse 23 says, for the Lord will pass through the land to smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into your house to smite you. That disease, that cloud of disease, or what, you know, the plague that went through the land of Egypt. Um, whenever there was a home that had this blood over the door, they were protected. The blood of Christ is the only thing that is going to immunize us against the final seven last plagues. Without the blood of Christ, we are fair game for the plagues. If we wanted to be protected, or should I say, if we want to be protected, we need to be in the house of God under the blood of the lamb. Well, then we have the story of Rahab. And I know I covered that a couple of weeks ago. And so I'm just going to touch on it. Uh, Rahab survived the coming of Joshua because she hung the scarlet cord from her window. Now, this scarlet cord represented the blood of Christ. And when Joshua, which is another form of the name Jesus, when he came and the Israelites came and the trumpets blew and the walls fell, everybody, everybody that was in her house survived. Anybody outside of her house were doomed. Now think about this, where was Rahab's house? It was on the wall, right? And what happened when they blew the trumpets and they went around the city seven times on the seventh day? They blew the trumpets, they shouted, and some kind of earthquake caused all the walls to fall flat, except in one spot. One little piece of wall survived. Now, is our Joshua coming soon? Is Jesus coming soon? And our trumpets going to blow? Will there be an earthquake? Yes, but there is a safe place. There is a designated house of God under the scarlet cord or the blood of the lamb. I'm also going to revisit another story that I touched on a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Jesus said that as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be when the son of man comes again. Noah's ark. Now, Genesis 7 verse 23 says, so he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. Do you want to be safe? Now that was some flood. 
Um, and only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alone, uh, alive as a result of that flood. It took Noah 120 years to build the ark. It was reinforced with Kevlar. It was bulletproof. Well, um, it wasn't Kevlar, but it was something stronger than that. It was floodproof. It was stormproof. Can you imagine? 100 foot waves, maybe higher waves, incredible winds. Can you imagine the waves that Noah and his family experienced? That must have been one pretty tough vessel. And only those inside that container survived. And, you know, where do we run to? Isaiah 32, verses 1 and 2 says, and I like these verses. Behold, a king will reign in righteousness and princes will rule with justice. A man will be as a hiding place from the wind and a cover from the tempest as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. Now, let's take a look at Psalm 61, verses 2 through 4. Psalm 61, verses 2 through 4. Here is God speaking um, through the psalmist. Actually, the psalmist speaking to God. And he says, from the end of the earth, I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. My friend, do you feel safe in the Lord's presence? A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand. Right? In the book, uh, The Hiding Place, Corrie ten Boom wrote about her life in a German concentration camp. Uh, She was talking with her sister about whether they could ever be safe again. Have you asked yourself that question? Can you ever be safe again? Well, her sister, Betty, answered, Corey, with these words. She said, the safest place in the world is to be in the middle of God's will. That was beautifully expressed, wasn't it? If you're in the middle of God's will, you have nothing to be afraid of. It's the safest place to be, no matter what's going on around you. You don't have to worry. And when the time comes for you to duck or to go underground or head for the hills or whatever it is God wants us to do at a certain time in earth's history, especially during the time of the plagues or before the plagues come, you know, there are times when in the Bible when God's people hid. Uh, Jonathan hid down in a well at one point. David hid in a cave. Uh, The Christians at the time when Jerusalem was about to be destroyed, they fled from the city. At a warning from God, they fled the city. I mean, there is nothing wrong when the time comes to intelligently duck, right? As long as we don't forget what our mission is. God has told us to share the gospel with people. And never has the gospel um, been more attractive than now for many people. Never has the opportunity been greater than now. Not only because of the mediums of communication that we have access to, uh, radio, television, internet, calling, uh, texting, but also, you know, people are afraid. Do you know that people are afraid? If you enter into conversations with strangers, you can tell they're afraid. They're looking for a place of safety for themselves and their families. And we know, as I pointed out uh, in the previous message, we know where that shelter is. It's Jesus Christ. And I feel this is such an important topic that I have to repeat myself. And that's why I have this message today. Jesus said it so simply in Matthew chapter 7. And you can't miss it. Uh, The wise man builds his house on the rock. The foolish man builds his house on the sand. When a storm comes, 
to the wise man, his house stands, right? In the story of the wise man and the fool, please catch these very important points. The storm comes to both, which means that in either scenario, Jesus said, there is a storm coming. There are going to be great calamities in the last days, maybe even before the last plague. And those calamities will affect all of us, both the children of God and those who are not. Just like in Egypt, there were three plagues that affected everyone. And then you had the seven last plagues affecting only the unbelievers, those who did not have God's protection. But if you build on the rock, you have nothing to worry about. Amen. And what was the rock in this story? Well, Jesus said that building upon the rock representing hearing his words and doing them. In other words, being a genuine, vibrant uh, follower of Jesus Christ. Accepting him and what he is all about. You know, I'm going to listen to your word, Jesus. I want to live by your word. I want to have that relationship with you. That's the only thing that's going to stand in the last days, my friend. Have you accepted Christ? Are you hidden in the rock? Do you know that you are safe? Can you, do you have that peace from knowing that you are safe right now at this very moment? Do you have the security of being in Jesus? Are you able to sleep peaceably at night? not worrying about the future because you're building upon the rock. If so, you're ready for what's coming. Remember that our hope is in the Lord, not in medicine or technology or politics. Things will get worse before they get better. Let's be ready for Jesus' return and let's make sure we do our utmost for our friends and our loved ones and people we meet to, be, to help them get ready as well. There is a lot we don't know about the future, but the bottom line is quite simple. If Jesus comes today, will you be ready? If he comes tomorrow, will you be ready? If he comes in your lifetime, will you be ready? Now, we know that he's at the very least coming in our lifetime because when we die, <laughs> that's his coming for us. If you're building every aspect of your life on the rock, then you will be ready if he comes today or tomorrow or next week or next year or sometime in the future. You know, we ought to wake up every morning and say, maybe today. Live as if Jesus come today, and one day you will be right. Let us pray. Our loving and kind Heavenly Father, in the near future, Jesus will come back. The word is so clear, Father. We don't know exactly when, and we will not speculate on exactly when. But I, we have been called to be ready. And I just pray that you will help each one of us to be ready, that we today can have that peace that goes beyond any understanding. Help us, Father, to, to place our lives into your care today and to um, read your word and to trust your word and to live by your word and to accept whatever you give us from day to day and to take up our cross and follow you to make decisions for your kingdom moment by moment, as we look in the mirror and as we look at you, and creating us that longing to become more and more like Jesus and to follow in his footsteps. Thank you, Father, that you are giving us hope, that you have a future for us that is incredibly bright when we choose to um, align ourselves with you and to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Oh, Father, we have uh, many flaws, and we still have things we're working on in our lives. 
But we are so thankful that the victory comes through the Holy Spirit and that you will be the one that will um, bless us with wisdom and understanding and strength and whatever is needed in order to have the experience of life with you here and eternal life forevermore. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.